Hello and welcome. We're just letting some people join and then we will be underway in a minute. So thank you. All right, welcome everyone. So welcome. We're delighted to see people join us here today. And we're, we welcome especially Southward Global Fellows who've taken part in a range of our programs over the years. And we also see that some of you are new to Southward Global Seminar. We also welcome those people who have signed up to receive the recording of this afterwards. And of course, all those people who haven't signed up to receive the recording, but who might be watching it anyway, as it will be posted on our, on our website um, in the coming days. We wish that we were able to greet all of you personally in our palace in Salzburg, Austria, but we also value the fact that more of you can join us virtually, uh, either directly now or time lagged uh, in this manner. For those who don't know us, Salzburg Global Seminar is an independent, not-for-profit organization founded in 1947 to challenge current and future leaders to shape a better world. For 75 years, we've held retreats in our historic home of Schloss Leopoldskron in Salzburg, Austria. Our inspiring environment, remote from the day-to-day -day buzz, allows participants from across the globe to come together and speak candidly, learn from each other, and return to your companies, communities, offices with renewed purpose and fresh ideas. We convene diverse voices from across generations, geographies, and sectors, which would otherwise be unlikely to have a chance to exchange views. Together, they create outside the box solutions and expand their networks in unprecedented ways. Our focus is on addressing challenging questions that benefit from cross-sector and interdisciplinary dialogue and require the headspace to step back and explore innovative approaches. The three areas we focus on are trust and the rule of law, long-term and sustainable development, and creativity and social systems change. Today is not one of our usual programs, but rather an opportunity to introduce some of our recent work on a very important topic and to invite our fellows working on other subjects and the general public to become involved with these efforts as they continue to move forward. We originally conceived of and designed this initiative before the outbreak of COVID-19 in discussions we had with three US-based partners, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation, and the David Rockefeller Fund. We thank all three of them for their support and encouragement as we have moved forward, particularly under the changed circumstances of the pandemic. The overarching goals of what became the Global Innovations on Youth Violence, Safety, and Justice Initiative were to enhance community safety and cohesion, to reduce violence, crime, and incarceration, and to transform judicial and prison systems. We thought to look particularly at youth, not just juveniles, but also young adults, who had the highest tendency towards violence and contact with the justice system to see if we might not address instead the root causes. We saw that in many countries, there is a growing recognition that effective criminal justice reform needs to look beyond the usual toolkit and institutions of the criminal justice system itself. We also recognize that the pivotal contribution that global exchange could make to criminal justice reform efforts, including the seeding of new strategies in the United States and elsewhere. We started with the purpose of the criminal justice system understanding that the power of a, that a government exerts over citizens must be legitimized. Therefore, we set out to explore examples of where culture has changed from heavy policing and incarceration systems, the custody, control, and suppression models, toward a focus on human dignity. This approach has included top-down system overhauls, as well as bottom-up community-level interventions. Because of the pandemic, we ended up doing all of our meetings online in 2021. We ultimately brought together 67 Salzburg Global Fellows from 19 countries into small interlocking working groups. We looked for points of intervention and big potentially transformative ideas that could help shape the future of criminal justice systems. 
In addition to just mixing people from backgrounds traditionally engaged in criminal justice sector, we also brought in fellows from education, health, business, media, and cultural spheres. The rich learnings from our workshops throughout 2021 are summarized in a report we have just published. If you've not seen it already, my colleague Antonia will put a link to it in the chat. The report is designed in a web-based format to be accessible, so dive right in. The report has developed summary key takeaways, examples, and recommended resources. We will continue to highlight these examples through short reports, interview features, social media stories, and videos with our fellows. The next phase of this multi-year initiative opens today with a series of public webinars in which we identify some of the most promising global examples of violence reduction and criminal justice transformation proven through research to be effective, viable, and replicable. These may not be the answer to all questions, but we hope they will inspire all of you to think about alternatives that you might adapt when you, to where you live and where you work. We invite policymakers, public officials, and activists in positions able to spearhead new reforms to join us for the next round of conversations and actions starting later this spring. I'll say something at the end about how you might get involved with that, but uh, you know, please feel free to reach out to us um, and reach out to me and um, we will see how we can elaborate on these interactions. As the first webinar in the series though, Today, we're going to examine restorative justice, rehabilitation, and healing. And I recognize that those words mean different things to different people. And so our three eminent fellows today will, uh, will tell you what they mean from their perspective. Um, I'm delighted that we can welcome Petra Masapu-Shachova from the Czech Republic, and Hernan Garbenti martinez and Jana Rodriguez from the United States. Jana, incidentally, originally came to us through our Cultural Innovators Forum, and you'll quickly see the connection of our work here in the justice sector with cultural work and other areas that people are involved in. And I think that's also very important to underscore the humanity of what we're trying to do with this. We welcome discussion and questions to be posted in the chat box, so you all can put something up there. We'll have a chance at the end to have questions and answers and dialogue among the different people who are sitting here in this room today. Um, and you can also feel free as we're going on to engage with each other in the chat box um, and, and see what rich ideas we come out that we can address during that question and answer period later. So I would first like to introduce our first speaker, which is Petra uh, masapus Shakhova. And there's been quite a lot of interest among participants in the last year about restorative justice initiatives uh, in Europe and particularly in Central and Eastern Europe and countries which have had to undergo a transformation. And so I think it is, it is great that we are able to um, have the expertise of Petra as she leads off our webinar series. So Petra, I may turn over to you. Okay, thank you, Charles. Thanks for the opportunity to, to talk to you from Prague, uh, the center of Czech Republic, or the capital of the Czech Republic, uh, about restorative justice, about the Czech experience. And I'm very happy that uh, uh, we can have the discussion uh, about uh, those approaches, uh, actually in the context uh, of uh, Czech uh, history uh, of the criminal law and how it develops uh, also from the time of transformation and what does it mean like uh, what is the heritage of the maybe some communist patterns for the uh, uh, criminal law of our history and like how we were dealing with it uh, uh, in the current days. So I will talk uh, about restorative justice a little bit in this context and um, I will try to start to share my um, presentation. So, hope you can see it. Okay. Uh, so just um, uh, because I have for about 10 minutes, so I will try to be brief and uh, I, I just want to on the beginning, like to see for you just to see the context where restorative justice came from, how it developed, because it's actually um, uh, 
giving us the opportunity to look on crime and its consequences uh, from a different perspective, because it's asking not how to find and punish the offender, but it's more asking like uh, what the people need after the crime occurs, how to fulfill those needs and how to involve people who were, uh, who were um, uh, like who were part of the cr crime situation, uh, how to uh, participate on looking for the solution. So those are the basic uh, main questions uh, where it all started from, uh, and they were uh, they were developed by Howard Zer, the main leader in the early nineties. And um, I don't know if you see now what's on the. <laughs> Do you see more than the arrow? I don't know. Uh, no. Okay. So it means that uh, it does not show up full, full <laughs> this slide. So. Uh, so I will tell you like the answer how it all started just by my words. Uh, so it started in practice and uh, it started with the need like to make more sense to support the offenders in receiving responsibility to understand uh, uh, the consequences and uh, it all started with very small initiatives in practice. I think this is very important to mention in relationship to restorative justice, that it came from practice and all the the theoretical concepts developed uh, uh, several decades later. Um, so the first initiatives we can see in Canada and in US in the early 70s and in 90s came first uh, like the theoretical concept and the development of all the ideas, what it actually means restorative, how we define it and like what are the how restorative programs, which is the platform where the people meet and talk together uh, what shall be the solution for their situation. So uh, after all that, only the, the main um, international institutions reacted on their already in 90s as well on the United Nations uh, level, also in Europe in the context of uh, Council of Europe, of U European Union. So the, starting from 90s, we had the first legislative act that reacted um, on development of restorative justice in practice. Oh, now it's there. <laughs> okay, now I know. So, uh, so you already, uh, I, I mentioned it that, so I would like to only to show you that uh, they were really like uh, reflections on, uh, on uh, on the international level, on United Nations Council of Europe and European Union with different legislative acts, which are having importance for the development of national levels. Um, what was important for restorative justice is that uh, from the very beginning, it was, uh, 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 it was very connected around restorative programs. And as I said, the programs are the platform where people in a secure environment with the help of a third facilitator, third person, have a dialogue about the cause and effects and solutions for their situation. So it gives voice to the people in a way that they would not normally have them during the criminal proceedings. Uh, in a secure space, like the victim is able to say their stories, uh, what does it mean for them to live with the consequences of the crime. And uh, for the offender, it means to also for him in a secure space to hear the story and reflect on it from their personal point of view. And together, those people have space to look for solutions. So this was the starting point for restorative justice, but it made a big difference and development throughout the years. And where is it now? Like you see the principles for the most recent legislative instrument that, that came out uh, from the uh, Council of Europe um, platform. And it's saying that restorative justice is not just about those programs, but about principles. And those principles are actually uh, challenging the old paradigm of, res uh, of criminal justice as, as its own, because it's saying that it's not about just uh, 
finding and punishing the offender, but it's also about uh, giving space for repairing harm and involving people in the process. Uh, also, the, the directive that I am um, uh, uh, that I'm mentioning is uh, naming also different uh, different principles, and those principles are, uh, as you see here on the slide, it's con uh, it's uh, focusing on the needs, on reparation, supporting reintegration. So all those principles shall be something that we really keep in mind. We put it on the, like on the main level, on, on the level of goals, how we want to proceed during the criminal proceedings, how we want to treat the people, and actually what we want to get out of the criminal proceedings. So those were like some uh, important um, inputs that we took in the Czech Republic uh, when reflecting how to proceed further with the Council of Europe recommendations that, that I mentioned. It. And, um, what we are doing now here is um, that we are trying to look ways how to how to implement those principles in the whole criminal justice system. What we shall do? Uh, it this input came actually in the moment where we are already for twenty years running here restorative programs uh, by a state institution, probation and mediation service. But when we started a dialogue uh, with all the professionals from the field and with the institution that we invited for the dialogue how to implement those principles. Uh, we actually saw that having just those programs, it's not enough uh, to use the principles in practice in general. So, um, we did, so we wanted to have some strategy how to proceed further, but we didn't want to have strategy that is written by a small group of people. So we we saw the best idea how to how to look for the new ways is actually to use the restorative principles for for this communication itself. So we open up a series of debates uh, with. Uh, all the main institutions and professionals. And we were asking them when creating the strategy, what they think is the main obstacle uh, why we are not proceeding further with those restorative principles, even though we are actually for 20 years having restorative programs. And what came out uh, from this discussion is that uh, we are actually running on some old pattern. And uh, what is this old pattern about? Uh, I think that uh, it's somehow connected um, to our own Czech history, but maybe there might be some other connotations that would be similar for other countries as well. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, our history and our heritage has some big uh, importance like uh, for, for the whole process. And um, uh, the, the old pattern where I actually see it is that um, uh, for 40 years, the country was uh, uh, governed by some authority, by some rules and uh, by uh, not giving voice to people uh, saying, expressing freely uh, what they need. So there was this development where somebody else actually knows better for you uh, what your needs are. And um, this authority was always wasted in some, um, uh, with some professions, like uh, if it would be a teacher, if it would be a doctor, if it would be a judge, uh, it was all the same. So we can still this pattern like where somebody else knows better and the person uh, whose case is decided is actually um, uh, uh, is actually trusting uh, this authority and uh, it's not having normally the space to um, uh, to uh, to say freely uh, their stories, their needs. So uh, I think this is some kind of a, a line, specific line of the, our heritage that we are dealing. But this process is changing. We can already see how is it changing in the 
in the parenting, uh, in families, how is it changing in the school, how is it changing also in the healthcare. So those are like small things that are somehow somewhere connecting a little bit together, but they are still, you can see that something is moving also in the criminal justice system. So this is like what we need to do now is to deal with the old pattern, uh, something that um, uh, helps to, to bring the, uh, the, the, the respect for the authority uh, with more the participatory level that allows the people to take part on their case. So the, dealing with the old pattern was something that we recognize as very important. Beside that, we also have, uh, of course, the need to deal with the, uh, the, the lack of information and uh, education. And so those are things that are connected around it. But in the end, we were happy that the, the dialogue led to uh, a strategy of restorative justice for the Czech Republic uh, that actually this year ended up in the program declaration of the Czech government. So we hope that this is something, some promising step for the future. But um, what it will bring us, we will see. Uh, the, the last thing that we that we are now currently dealing with and preparing is uh, something we call restorative platform. Because what we actually found out, and this is connected with the old pattern and uh, the old paradigm, is that we need to uh, work with people and their attitudes, maybe even with their soft skills, how they approach um, they work, how they approach people uh, in the criminal proceedings. So we are now working uh, in a two years old, uh, long program with all the professions, with the support of the all institutions in the uh, criminal justice field. And we are talking with them what it would mean for them to come uh, on Monday morning at work and to use uh, RJ principles in their daily work. And this two years uh, discussion will lead in some uh, conclusions, recommendations, uh, and with the support of the main uh, institutions in the criminal justice field, we hope to have chance to, to, to widespread them further. So this is uh, my short introduction, what we are now doing in the Czech Republic. Uh, with, uh, with the vision that uh, restorative principles can somehow really shift the paradigm uh, of the criminal justice uh, itself, that it can not uh, like um, replace the old one, I would say, but it's more to widen the perspective, to be there like a, uh, something that, uh, that you add to the old and together you create something new. So this is, uh, uh, this is uh, some, uh, I would say exciting moment for us. And uh, we, are, uh, um, we are really looking forward where all those initiatives uh, will lead to. But uh, my own impression is that already actually came into move and uh, we are hopeful what will come. Thank you. Thank you, Petra. It's all very exciting. Something, Petra, that you have said in our discussions and also on the short video that is uh, on our website where you appear um, is this concept of thinking, what is the justice system for? Um, and the purpose of the justice system is justice, obviously. Uh, but how do you achieve that? And is that uh, going through these sort of traditional lock everybody away and, and, and that's, that's justice? Or are there alternative methods to, to, um, that are more just and more fair? Uh, I'd like to use that to segue over to Hernan Carvente Martinez, who's, um, who works in the United States. And Hernan, um, if I could ask you, um, your bio is going up now on the, um, in the chat. But if, uh, if I could ask you to start off with just responding to the concept of restorative justice as, as Petra has presented it and as it is being applied in the Czech Republic and from your own lived experience, uh, how that speaks to you or doesn't speak to you, whether you think it is replicable and then some of the innovations and the work that you're doing, which are very exciting as well um, in, in, in the healing sphere. So I will turn it over to you, Ernan. 
For sure. Thank you, Charles. And thank you, Petra, for leading off the conversation. Um, I think there's much to be said about the, the topic that we're talking about today. Uh, and Charles, you pointed it out from the very beginning. These terms are interchangeably used sometimes in different spaces, whether it's in the criminal justice space or in the mental health space, um, as if they mean the same thing. And oftentimes, restorative justice here in the US uh, legitimately means just getting someone uh, the mental health support that they need. And in other instances, it really means getting both the person who has caused harm and the person who experienced harm to be in the same place. And so there is that sort of uh, similarity with, within the Czech Republic. I think it's very important to acknowledge that the use of any you know, terms like offender or convict or criminal, uh, which are often used inside of the context of that is, is not really restorative at all. <laughs> um, it's not helpful at all. If anything, it just further criminalizes and demonizes uh, even before we get a conversation around restoration to happen. And so I think that as I was hearing, you know, sort of the, the work that's happened in the Czech Republic, I feel like any other country other than the US right now is somehow some way doing a better job uh, at engaging people who are incarcerated and the numbers are usually lower in other countries. Um, mostly because you're not locking up just every single person uh, that comes into contact with the law. But here in the US, uh, we have a huge incarceration problem. Despite us lowering the number over the last decade, we still have millions of people coming in and out of prisons who are currently under supervision um, or who are maybe not even, didn't go into the system but are currently on probation um, and can be just one mistake away from actively going back into the system uh, and spending a long period of time. And so I think that there's there's, there's a lot of the there's a lot of pieces uh, related to restorative justice uh, that we think about as as very broad broadly defined terms uh, that don't actively capture everything that we're trying to do with that work. Um, so I have a hard time uh, really using the term restorative justice, uh, particularly because anything that has the word justice behind it is automatically, in one way or another, uh, immediately siloed to the criminal justice conversation. And the reality is is that restoring any amount of dignity and human you know, capacity has nothing to do with just the criminal justice system. There are so many other support systems that people need in order to thrive and succeed. And that I think is the most important thing to, that I was thinking about as I was listening to Petra's presentation around this, right? Like how do we take restorative justice as an umbrella term that has a, a sort of variety of different support systems and structures in place? Uh, and how do we make that possible? And I say that as Charles pointed out, as someone who did experience the justice system uh, firsthand. So I, I will share, you know, I don't know if there's anyone who is directly impacted. Um, and if I'm the only one here, that in and of itself is a problem uh, because we don't have a lot of people who are formally incarcerated as a part of these conversations. And I think part of what I've learned in my work for the last nine years of being out of prison is that when we're talking about restorative justice, when I've spent time in prison, there was no such concept. It was always about uh, punishment. It was always about retribution and it was always about an eye for an eye. So if I cause harm, I'm getting some level of harm done back to me. And I think in America, we have that huge problem of actively uh, thinking that that is the way we're going to solve uh, every issue, which is just by incarcerating people and punishing them and that that's going to be the active solution. I went into the justice system for the crime of attempted murder. It is not a crime I am proud of. I always say that off the jump. It is a crime that I committed at a time when I was 15 years old, when I was full of anger, when I was gang affiliated, when I had substance abuse issues, when I had experienced layers upon layers of violence, both at home, in the community, and growing up uh, both in Mexico and in the US. And so whenever I bring up the crime, oftentimes I ask people, what was the first image that you thought of in that moment? You might've thought of the immediate action, You know, what happened? Why would he actively attempt to murder someone? The immediate question doesn't go back to, what led to that moment? What were the active you know, things that that young person went through for them to think that holding a gun and pointing it at someone who looked like them was the active right thing to do in that moment. And for me in that moment, it was a moment of survival and it was a moment of me thinking that that was the only way to resolve conflict at the time, uh, especially when someone from my gang at the time um, and family to me at the time uh, had actively been killed by the opposing gang. And so, you know, we don't unpack to that level when it comes to these conversations. And I think that that's been one of the, the things that I've really prioritized in making sure that we do. When you go into the justice system, 
we have a huge conversation happening all the time in the concept of rehabilitation that's about trauma-informed care. And when I went in, I felt like every conversation that I had with a counselor or anyone who was a mental health clinician immediately focused on all of the bad and negative that I went through and never really focused on the things that I needed for me to actively recover from that, heal from that, and actively move to a much more uh, supportive and, and thriving lifestyle for myself. There's an abundance of uh, conversations happening here in the US around that particular uh, dynamic. And we're trying to make sure that as we're doing this, that there are conversations happening around what does it mean to move away from this concept of just trauma-informed care, which is very deficit-based. It thinks a lot about the negatives and more to healing-centered engagement, which is around really focusing on helping people get to a better place where they can actively thrive uh, in whatever setting they are in. Because again, some people are still gonna live in very impoverished conditions, are gonna still live in very uh, violent uh, environments. And so how do we help people get to that place where they can actually achieve uh, that healing that they need to do to get to where they are. And I am 29 years old right now. I always say, and trigger warning for anybody who has experienced or has been close to the concept of suicide. I attempted suicide three years ago after having been out already for six years, after having successfully made it, quote unquote, in the justice field as an organizer nationally, doing work all over the country, getting awards from foundations, doing amazing work to other people. But behind the scenes, I was still drinking. I was still snorting cocaine. I was still actively being harmful to women in my life. I was still actively causing harm and nobody knew. Um, and it was because I was experiencing all of this while being in the work, in the work where I'm actively surrounded by people who are experiencing trauma on a day-to-day -day, and I'm actively working with that over and over, having never addressed or given been space in any way to process my own trauma. And so I think even in saying that out loud, that, you know, I try to be vulnerable about it, but it's really hard to sometimes say that out loud as a, an organizer and as someone now doing this work because it exposes me to being vulnerable, but also for people to see my humanity as a person, as an organizer, and as someone who's actively doing healing justice work, but at the same time, just being a human being who's still in many ways and pardon you know, my language, but fucking up every day. And, and I think that that's part of the reason why I strive right now to really look at organizations all over the country here in the US that are doing work in some capacity around this. And there are many, I'm not gonna sit here and try to uh, you know, list out every single one of them. Here are some that I've had the pleasure of either working with or having had a friend or someone that currently works in those organizations. I've sent all the names, the locations and the links on the, in the chat room. Feel free to check them out. There are organizations that are doing restorative justice work. There are organizations that call it healing justice work. And there are organizations that are simply saying that it's work to heal our communities and not, not, not trying to define themselves within those terms because those terms in some way mean something to the funding community, mean something to government, or mean something entirely different to community members. And so oftentimes this work um, is not broadly defined enough for community to actually even connect to it. And so I'm very cautious of uplifting organizations and people doing this work. And I'd rather us all think of this work as a, a collective vision for trying to heal from the effects of mass incarceration here in the United States. But we are learning. Uh, we are trying to actively navigate all of these challenges. There are organizations like Common Justice, uh, like the Vera Institute and others who are trying to work with systems to actively support people who have caused harm, whether you're in the community or you're already in a cell in the present moment. And there are other organizations like La Placita Institute, Homeboy Industries, HALA, Communities United for Restorative Justice that do current work in the community, working with community members to really think about what does healing look like in the context of that particular community. And I think that that's one of the things that we often uh, get really wrong when it comes to systems leading that work is that they want to take a blueprint or a model or something that has worked in another state and apply it exactly the same way in their state. And the reality is, is that, that it's not going to work unless it's been developed by that community, it's been accepted by that community, and that you're actively even having the conversations with the people who've been directly impacted in that community to lead that work. There is a part of this that I didn't actively think about until I was speaking right now, where you have people like credible messengers here in the US who, are, we, who we are building up to be the people actually doing this work, essentially people who've been formerly incarcerated doing the healing work with the community that they actively might've caused that harm in. 
But the reality is, is that those positions are oftentimes underpaid. Uh, they are not fully supported. Those organizers, those people doing the work are actively experiencing their own issues and their basic needs at times have not even been met. And yet we're demanding and asking of them to show up into the community and to do this work in partnership with systems when they themselves, like me a couple of years back, had not addressed any of the trauma that they had gone through. And so I'll end with this, which is that when I attempted suicide three years ago, the last three years of my life uh, had led to me actively seeking out therapy uh, for myself. Uh, I went to about uh, 15, 14 different therapists uh, until I found one that I actually could relate to and work with. Um, I actively then started taking medication for bipolar two disorder, uh, did not go well at all, um, actively struggled with that and struggled with other issues of addiction. And ultimately I ended up coming off of medication and I was going through all of this without the support of family, without the support of the youth justice organizing space that I was a part of and could not even mention it to my employer at the time because I was afraid of the stigma that would come with that. And also people thinking that I was unstable and unfit to do this work. And so there's a lot of that associated with this that I think we need to uplift as we continue these conversations moving forward that we don't even create safe spaces within our own organizations to talk about this, but we wanna support other communities in doing this work. To date, I've been in therapy for about three years. I've been fairly stable. I do have my moments, um, you know, like two days ago where I was in the couch for about five hours and could not move because I was in a depressive state. And I'm comfortable with sharing that. I'm open with sharing that. Uh, and because I really wanna create a safe space for people to actively be able to have that um, in their lives. And so that's the work that I'm doing at Healing Ninjas right now, not really trying to create another model of restorative justice or of healing. Um, I'm really just trying to uplift all of these amazing organizations and all of the amazing supports that are out there, including networks for um, Latinx therapists or therapists who uh, specifically focus on the Black and African American community uh, and others who focus maybe also on the queer community. And so there's so many different networks out there. And I feel like everybody moves in silos all the time here in the US. And so Healing Ninjas for me is about building a community where everybody who is in need of these supports has an immediate place to access everything that's available, not just within the criminal justice space, but within the broader healing and mental and wellness space that is out there and making sure that these organizations are, are uplifted, supported, but that they're also accessible to everyday people. Because when I looked for a therapist uh, three years ago, it was hell to even find one um, because I could not find people who looked like me, who related to me, or who understood the context of being in prison and what it meant to now be in the community and trying to heal from that. And so I offer that as, as an example of what we should strive for in terms of creating a space for these conversations to continue uh, and making sure that we are actively working together, uh, both here in the US and globally, which is beautiful to be able to have these conversations uh, and create what I'm calling a healing revolution. We need that, especially during uh, this era of COVID where the next generation, which my daughter is 13 years old, um, their mental health uh, is in literal crisis at this moment. Um, and we are in a state of an emergency in different places around the US because they're, all of that mental health struggle that they have been going through over the last two and a half years of being in COVID is now showing up in the classroom. And so what does that mean you know, for the future generation that is coming uh, what does that mean for the criminal justice system? And more importantly, what does it mean for the future of our different countries uh, and making sure that you know, we have healthy, thriving citizens who can contribute uh, in one way or another? So I'm open to questions after the discussion, of course, uh, but thank you for having me, Charles. Uh, really, really happy to be here. Anand, thank you so much for sharing and for being so open. Um, it's, it, it is really good to have these um, real experiences. Uh, and not just textbook experiences. And that's so valuable for this discussion. So thank you. Um, and I'd like to use that to move over to, uh, to Gianna, uh, who will tell you about some of the work that she is doing in, in, in Baltimore. Um, she can maybe respond a little bit from, from, uh, from Petra and Ernan, but that's, a, I think, a good guidance in. I'd also like to say to those people who are going to be watching this on, um, on, the, on the video and who are not, therefore do not have access to the chat, that we will be gathering all of these rich resources that are being put into the chat and we'll make those available as well to people who, who are watching the video and cannot see the chat. So Hernan has posted uh, a bunch of resources 
uh, those will go into, um, we'll post those along with the video uh, so that everybody who's watching at home later can, can access those as well. So Jana, if I may turn over to you, Jana's bio should be going up in the chat as well. And um, Jana, you can tell us about uh, your exciting work. And as I said earlier, Jana came to us through our Cultural Innovators Forum, and you'll see exactly what that means as she comes in from a, uh, a sort of arts and culture uh, aspect to, to dealing with these issues. Jana. Thank you. Um, thank you, Charles and Antonia and everyone at Salzburg and uh, Petra and Hernan. It's really a pleasure being on a panel with you and learning about the work that you do. Um, so firstly, very quickly responding to Petra, um, when I knew that we would be responding to you, I was, I was like, I know nothing about the Czech Republic. <laughs> uh, I know a fair amount about the prison industrial complex in the United States, so I you know, looked into it a bit and, you know, Hernan uh, touched on a lot of the points that I wanted to respond with, so I won't repeat those, but population size much smaller. Um, prison population size, much, much smaller. I think it's like 19,000, a little bit under that in the country. Uh, I, this is fairly from, uh, only from uh, internet research. So, um, you know, that is drastically uh, different. So it, it's, it's beautiful to learn about this initiative and it, um, the extent of it. No way can I imagine that happening in the United States. Um, you know, uh, the shift in your country, um, you're, you have this uh, you mo moment of transition, this national maybe identity, um, where people have a similar experience in moving from what happened pre-90s to now. Um, we don't have that. We ha are um, a very segmented society um, where people are still not free who are not in prison. <laughs> um, and uh, thinking about who is mostly affected by the prison industrial complex, um, just the fact that 50% of people in the United States voted for Trump in the last election is indicative to me that it would be a hard um, move to move towards a restorative justice practice nationally. But there are a lot of people around the US, as Hernan mentioned and shared in the chat, who are doing this work. Um, and it is interesting because, um, as you said, restorative justice has kind of been co-opted in a sense. And a lot of organizers and activists in the US are talking more about abolition, um, not reform of the uh, system, but defunding and abolishing what exists because um, any reform is still going to affect the people that it's always affected. Um, so I won't say more because uh, Hernan did an amazing job at responding to you, Petra, but thank you for sharing. Um, not to be completely pessimistic, because to be in this field, I think you have to have a, a naive optimism <laughs> about the future and, <laughs> you know, hope for what can change um, to stay in it because it is very hard. Okay, now. Um, I'll share with you about what we do at Baltimore Youth Arts. And uh, there's actually someone here, the deputy director is in the participants. Thank you, Leisha. Okay. So. My name is Gianna Rodriguez. I'm the founder and director of Baltimore Youth Arts. Here are some of our amazing staff and young people. We are covered in paint because we are artists primarily. Um, this is Baltimore Youth Arts mission. We are a creative entrepreneurship and job training program for young people ages 14 to 22 and a little bit older with a focus on those involved in the justice system. BYA was developed based on the following, youth exiting the justice system lack consistent access to social services. A large number of youth involved with the system, oops, sorry, um, have been diagnosed with mental health or behavioral issues. Youth involved in the system benefit from commingling with peers who are not. This also allows for anonymity. Um, the relationships between incarcerated and or exiting youth and adults are often limited and transitory. Long-term supportive relationships are beneficial to young people, particularly those re-entering their communities and youth, especially those transitioning back to their communities have difficulty seeking and securing employment. 
So BYA began in 2015 inside the Baltimore City Juvenile Justice Center. This is an image from um, one of my first classes. It went really well. This is another, um, this is the Baltimore City Juvenile Justice Center. This is the Thomas uh, Waxer Center, Center for Young Women in Laurel, Maryland. Um, so classes were going really well. Youth were really interested, um, planning to go home. Um, and then it, the thought was, what then? Like, how do you maintain a relationship? What are we going to do? Um, and along with uh, two of my first students, we made some plans to start uh, the employment program at the BYA Community Studio. And this is an image from our first uh, session of the Studio Apprentice Program in 2016. And we've been employing young people year round ever since. Um, so our program is rooted in building relationships and maintaining them because um, that is the work that is involved. Um, we are open to anyone 14 to 21. Young people um, only want to try, if they want to try our program, um, and they fit our age range, they qualify. There's nothing else. Youth do not need a resume. They don't need to be employed elsewhere priorly. Um, we adjust our schedule to young people. Um, so youth have to go to their PO. They might have something after school or um, some other things that get in the way. We adjust it for them. They are paid hourly from the start. They're paid for every part of the program. Um, we employ them year round, as I said. Um, we are ever changing. We don't have a set curriculum. Things are based on youth's wants and needs. Um, and we run circles and meetings where they give us feedback and choose what happens in the next session. Here's an image from our community studio now. Um, in addition to the arts classes that we offer, um, as I said, young people are employed. They also go through uh, college career readiness and life skills classes, so resume writing. They learn how to do mock interviews. They meet with employers. They get help with college apps, job applications, um, uh, uh, connections to training in the community. Um, and we also connect them to our local partners for job training and educational opportunities. Here's a beautiful image of one of our showcases pre-COVID. Some images that young people did for a public event. Um, Pre-COVID, we went to a lot of museums, traveled to DC, around Baltimore. Um, as I said, we have partnerships. So we have, there's uh, employer partners throughout the community that either speak to young people about their professions or often open interviews for young people to work at their locations. In addition to that, we have uh, creative partnerships. So this is something we did with Baltimore Office of uh, Promotion and the Arts. And we did a, a public screen printing workshop where young people uh, screen printed with uh, up to 500 um, folks over a weekend. And they made all the prints and designs and led the stations. Um, so young people also do commissions. So. Um, Hernan talked about Restorative Response Baltimore. We have a longstanding partnership with them. This is a bag that young people um, designed and screen printed for them as a commission. 24 and None is a new program in Baltimore. Um, that is a logo that BYA youth designed for them. And then on the right is a mural that youth, some of who were recently released from uh, detention, did a mural for the Office of the Public Defender, who is one of our longstanding partners as well. They refer young people to us. Um, in addition to this, young people are able to sell their artwork on our online store. If you go to shopbya.org, you can look at the work that um, they have made and that they sell, and young people get 80 to 90% of the profit. So they earn hourly wages, and then they can earn additional profits from the sale of their artwork. Here are some examples of the work that's been created in our program. Um, and because some people like data, here are some numbers about the impact. Um, we've worked with over a thousand youth since 2015. We've employed over 110 young people in our studio apprentice program, um, many of whom who have remained for years. Um, in uh, fiscal year 21, we ran 128 classes, employed 59 youth apprentices. And so far in this, in this year, we have engaged 87 youth and employed 48 youth apprentices. Um, 
this is just some um, social emotional metrics. We see large increases across a number of measures from confidence to feeling like they're part of a community, um, feeling that they have a voice, that they have support. These are just some things that you can look at in the PowerPoint afterwards. Um, so yeah, I'll just leave on this because one of the main challenges we've had throughout our time has been um, the disbelief in how powerful an arts program could be. And these are some ways that we see our work um, affecting young people, helping to explore identity, um, impacting community, building relationships between youth, between youth and adults, between youth and community members, um, helping youth uh, communicate their thoughts and ideas, especially in thinking about different learning styles and communication styles, um, identifying and managing emotions, expressing emotions, and gaining those hard and soft skills that can transfer into different career paths or education, even your family, their relationships with their friends. Um, mostly, uh, the creative process, you know, we're talking about restorative justice um, and you know Hernan talked about trauma-informed care and programming. Uh, the creative process demonstrates um, messing up is okay and through this program we hope that youth learn that, that they have the support to go back, look at their mistakes and um, troubleshoot uh, how to fix them. So that is where I will end about BYA. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, Gianna. That was that was great. Um, it's 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 really nice to see these these perspectives. I'd like to quickly kick it back over to 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 Petra just to respond because obviously the Czech Republic and uh, the United States are are quite different countries. But the Czech Republic has gone through a a transformation, and I wonder, Petra, if you're in your response, it's not just, I mean, you've, you've talked about the need to seek out justice, and I take that with the caveat that Ernan has, has raised as well, but the, the issue here is how do you address the people who have been the victims of, of crimes, the needs of the, the people who are coming out of the system, especially young people who've gotten sucked in and, and, uh, and are trying to escape from the system, uh, and, and how society as a whole, you've talked about the importance of changing mindsets being very important, uh, how society as a whole can look to that as a reform, because you've, you've gone a great distance in the Czech Republic uh, in terms of changing mindsets, but it's not uh, always been easy. So maybe you can, you can respond to Arnan and Jana uh, and think about the people um, across the system and the people outside the system who 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 need their minds maybe uh, maybe changed a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I would like to thank so much also for my co-presenters uh, for their uh, perspectives and uh, maybe in the beginning uh, I would say that um, uh, even for me like. Um, uh, sometimes I feel like uh, that maybe the, the word restorative, uh, it's a little bit limiting for me and I really uh, um, am very close to Hernan, what Hernan was saying that it shall be actually the healing process. Maybe we are not really ready uh, to to be talking about the change as a healing process. Sometimes. <laughs> You have to be cautious about the words you are using. So, but uh, uh, I, for me, uh, I, I, I really, uh, I'm very close uh, to what was said in that direction. So, um, uh, always what I, what I try to, and what I was really grateful also, what I was, uh, what I mentioned that was the development in Europe that we finally talk about the principles. We talk about changing the culture of justice and uh, about, uh, about using those principles in very broad sense. Uh, so, and I have to say like uh, for, for you who are not um, um, close to the history of this part of Europe, it's not like that uh, something changed in the 90s and now we are, uh, we are uh, living in some paradise. 
no, no, no. Like uh, we are, for example, uh, in the criminal justice system, we are uh, like, the, for example, the criminal procedure code, we are using still the one from the 60s and waiting for the new one. So it's not like that uh, something came and now uh, we have rainbow on every corner. So um, uh, it's, a, it's a very slow process because uh, all those, uh, the, the mindset, all the patterns, it's, it's so deep, like in, I would say in the soul of the society, but in each of the individuals, it's passing from generation to generation. So somehow to cut it and uh, uh, it's, it's not like you can do this and it's out. So it's a, it's a slow process. And uh, I think about, it's about opening uh, the dialogue also in various fields, also outside the justice. And in some way, I always saw that uh, the criminal justice field always reflects actually, or is mirroring what's actually happening in the society in general. So uh, we like, the, 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 the criminal justice field just shows like what's going on uh, somewhere else. Um, so um, uh, I would say that uh, changing the mindset uh, uh, is difficult. Uh, it's a long process, but you just need to start one day and just work for it and uh, uh, take, uh, take some direction and just go. And uh, so we are really happy that uh, now we have this, uh, we have several tools how to open the dialogue and invite more people into thinking like how to change the dialogue, uh, how to change the mindset and how to change the attitudes and uh, what does it actually mean when you do it. So one representative of this platform is actually here. Uh, you cannot see him, but it's Martin Lisek, the judge. So uh, uh, I don't know if he would later, like if maybe I uh, would like to say his own reflections, like how is it to be part of this process? Let's see. Uh, but um, uh, I just uh, want to maybe, and maybe I would mention one more thing that also, uh, uh, from uh, from the uh, uh, from the research uh, with the public uh, wider public uh, that was done by the Czech Institute for Criminology and Social Prevention, it came out that when you could explain people the alternatives, uh, uh, they they like it actually, but they need to understand. So sometimes, and mostly it's like also on the political level, the politicians think that uh, the, the, the Czech society is very repressive and rigid and blah, blah, blah. And that's why they are also offering those solutions. But actually uh, the, the outcome of the research was that when it's explained and when it's explained well, uh, it's also received well. So I take this as some positive um, uh, tool on the way. And uh, uh, yeah, and uh, it's just, I don't know if I answered the questions, but at least I hope uh, part of them. Thank you, Petra. Um, Martin Lisek, I realize you're a sitting judge, but if you would like to um, to comment, uh, this is on the record, I might say. So uh, if you if you don't feel comfortable, I'm not I'm not going to force you to speak publicly. But if you would like to, I invite you to. You are muted. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Petra, for inviting me to the discussion. I am not prepared to say something, but uh, uh, generally, I am very happy about the process we are going through in Czech Republic. Uh, and uh, thank Petra and the uh, Restorative uh, Institute of Restorative Justice, uh, which starts the changes or started the changes. Uh, I'm a criminal judge uh, and I'm part of uh, uh, restorative platform, as Petra mentioned, uh, and uh, uh, I'm happy to uh, discuss uh, the topics of restorative justice because the discussion is the start. 
the start of uh, change. And I hope uh, our uh, criminal justice system will see the benefit of restorative justice uh, as the judges and also all uh, people coming into the criminal justice system. And uh, I see the benefits for uh, the victims and uh, for the accused or, or offenders um, because it uh, brings uh, um, more in the future, not just punishing people, just thinking of their needs. And I think you've frozen there. So, <laughs> but thank you, Martin. Um, I'd, I'd like, I, we've received a question um, and I've been asked if I might, might say it on her behalf. This is from Judge Shoshana Berman from Israel. She is a former judge on the Israeli District Court. She's now retired. She was a member of the Salzburg Global Seminars Academic Advisory Board in 1982 to 1987. And she first came to Salzburg uh, for a program in 1979. So we're delighted uh, that you're back with us. Um, and, uh, and thank you for sending in your question. Um, Shoshana writes that she is um, personally skeptical about restorative justice. Uh, and so maybe the panelists today can, can address this. Uh, she, is, she says that she's concerned about applying it to the aftermath of a crime. There are good principles for preventing or reducing future crime, which is the main goal of a justice system, she writes. She would rather concentrate on what she calls the pre-math as opposed to the aftermath, the pre-math of violence and crime. She says that the interaction between the offender um, and the victim by mediation, taking responsibility and repairing the harm is not at all possible in serious crimes. Would one suggest to a young woman who is brutally raped to interact with her rapist? By just looking at him, the whole scene may be lived by all by her again? And how can one repair the lifelong harm that was caused to her? How can, how can a young man who stabbed his wife to death seek reconciliation, even if he has taken responsibility for his crime and confessed that he murdered her because she irritated him? This is, uh, this is this. And Shoshana has said it's frustrating that despite all of this, um, in the field of criminology, victimology, rehabilitation, and transformation, that people are not addressing the stage before there is violence, the what people are coming through in their lives before they become violence, the youth uh, of the world who might become violent in the future, uh, if we can address the problems before the violence actually occurs, isn't this actually better than trying to, uh, to do it in, a, um, in the aftermath of a crime? So um, I don't know if uh, which of the panelists would like to respond to uh, to, to Shoshana first. I see. I, yeah, I would. Um, sorry, I, I if you have not heard of uh, Miriam Kaba, you can't see this it's blurry. Um, I'll put her name in the chat. Um, All right, Miriam Kaba is an abolitionist, a community worker activist. Um, she has a number of books. I've been to trainings by her. Um, she speaks a lot about the restorative justice practice. Thank you. Um, and uh, also speaks on um, these practices for um, victims of sexual violence. Um, I am not a... Um, expert in that, but I, I um, would say look into her and her writing. Um, it's worth it for anyone who's interested in this work and learning about some work that's happening in the U.S. And I think, um, you know, Her Hernan touched on um, how we're like a constellation, a, a network of people doing this work. And there are a number of people who are doing some restorative justice who also do the, um, the work prior. So, you know, BYA is one of many examples how we are both a diversion program and um, a, a, a restorative program for youth who are coming home, um, reentry program. So that is, um, it does take a lot more um, than just that one instance of a, a restorative um, meeting, um, 
schools um, and whatnot, bringing those things in. And it, there are uh, examples and I can try and find them quickly and put them in the chat. But yeah, I would say looking to Miriam Kaba. Petra, you have your hand up. Oh, yeah. Uh, thanks so much for those questions, uh, because I think uh, that, that those questions are um, uh, the ones that uh, uh, I hear uh, quite a lot. And uh, I think uh, that the concern about the, those issues is very important. And uh, I would say, um, I would say, like, First, maybe to start uh, with the with uh, like the the, the 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 goal of the whole system as preventing the reoffending or recidivism or to stop like committing crime, like um, uh, also within within the restorative justice concept, uh, we are asking like, is it actually really the only? only goal is it is this one the main goal like isn't like uh, fulfilling the needs of the vic victim the same important like like preventing the the offender uh, from prevent uh, from committing uh, further crimes so this is just i'm just adding that uh, to uh, to this uh, discussion the same thing uh, also goes in this line that uh, for example, the, the uh, restorative programs themselves have probably not the force that they would like solve all the issues. They have uh, uh, the potential to show some of the important issues for the people, but they would not work like some miracle um, uh, for everybody if the whole system is not connected together, not just the justice but a criminal justice system but also the social services and other fields that are very important when like allowing to people to be good part of the society so you need to have the system interconnected to to be able to fulfilling the needs uh, on various levels and perspectives uh, with the with the remark on the violent crimes i know that this is for a lot of people like somehow striking issue or it gives a lot of fear that in a violent crimes the people might meet but actually also uh, from the foreign experiences uh, not just uh, like uh, with some um, uh, crimes against uh, health, but also in crimes uh, uh, against um, uh, like uh, uh, with sexual violence, with domestic violence, those are all issues where the restorative programs can have very good benefits for uh, both offender and the victim, but it always depends if the people uh, decide for it and if it's for them the right way to go. Restorative justice is never a duty. It's always an offer that you enter freely. And uh, it's just like uh, for the facilitator to decide if it's the safe space for everybody to take part on it. Um, and there are good examples like from all the types of the crime, um, that for some people it's a good solution so what i think is that the system shall offer it uh, for in all the stages for all types of crime as a possibility uh, if somebody would like to enter i think this person shall have right and possibility to do that so uh, uh, in that way i think that um uh, we, we are also facing this here in the Czech Republic. For us, it is an issue that we are now opening the dialogue uh, with organizations that are working with victims, also with victims of serious crime. And it's an issue that we would like to be now opening here as well. But um, also there is a lot of uh, other material uh, that is showing that even for people uh, who are victims of very serious crimes, it might be a very good solution for their lives, how to move farther. And um, maybe the, the last uh, thing that uh, was mentioned is uh, the, the violence 
Uh, of course, the, uh, the violence that occurs in pre-stages of the criminal proceedings or of crime, and I totally agree with that. And uh, uh, that's also why we are now uh, um, like trying to show uh, that um, like the crime is only the most serious violation of some rules that we as society decided on. And that uh, <clears throat> like uh, some conflicts we all experience of, on everyday basis and trying to bring the dialogue as a tool for solving those conflicts is one issue that we are now focusing on. And uh, as somebody, some of you might know like restorative justice or restorative practices, it's not uh, a tool only for the justice, but it has a wide, range of use also in the educational system. So uh, there are very good experiences how to bring restorative practices into schools for young children uh, and uh, for them, like how to learn, how to deal with conflicts, uh, violence, like in the school environments and in their relationships. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hernan, we'll give you a chance to respond. And then I've also seen that, that, that Peter uh, Hampacher's hand is up. So that will be the next question after, after Hernan's response. Yeah, for sure. And I'll keep my remarks brief. But um, I, I completely agree that we, we have not done justice to the conversations that should be happening prior to anyone even coming into contact with the law. Um, there are conversations around sexual violence, there are conversations around just gang violence in communities that we do not know how to talk about. I think this is a larger issue beyond just restorative justice. We do not feel comfortable, whether here in the US or around the globe, talking about violence and talking about it in an intentional way that doesn't result in people being angry at each other or starting to like point at specific crimes. As someone who was, uh, again, convicted of attempted murder, I was gun one gunshot away from taking someone's life uh, and doing so intentionally at 15 years old. But I also went through sexual violence when I was seven years old. And it was only up until about two years ago when I actually shared that out loud. And so, you know, some young men can go with that experience for most of their life because of the stigma associated to it and never really talk about that. And so I completely agree with the question and the remark around the need for us to really address this very early on. And I think that that's why I always say that this isn't just a criminal justice conversation. This is very much a public health conversation. Uh, and we need to be talking about this very early, um, not just within uh, government structures, but again, at home, teaching families how to have these conversations, teaching uh, young people in school how to actively address some of this and talk about violence, uh, not as something that is um, uh, just a, not, not just a negative precursor to it, but also talking about that violence is, is a thing that can happen. And how do you step into that, right? How do you step into conflict? How do you actually resolve things uh, in an amicable and in a peaceful manner? Um, and sometimes, you know, there are cultures where it's like you throw down, you know, you fight someone hand to hand and whatever happened at the end, that's it. The, the fight is squashed and people are uncomfortable with that conversation. But in, in communities where I'm from, that's how, you know, we used to settle disputes, you know, by just having a flat hashing out that anger and letting it out. And some people will call that uh, immature. Some people will call that irresponsible. Uh, but when I see two young men after that, having, you know, a meal together after, flat, you know, hashing it out in some way, um, I think that that's, that's progress. I'd rather see them having a meal after they beat each other up than one of them being dead or the other one being in prison. And I think that this is where we don't have that topic um, uh, in a very light way, and I, I I speak about it freely because I am someone who was charged with violent felon with a violent felony and committed several acts of violent crime. I'm not proud of it, but I think part of what makes me better adaptable to the conversation is that I can talk about it from a place of accountability. And I think that that's the part that also gets messy. We talk about violence, and then we immediately think about how do you hold someone accountable? And accountability for all of us is immediate punishment, is immediate incarceration, is immediate harm, you know causing harm again. Um, accountability is not rooted in restoration. Accountability is not rooted in love or healing. Uh, and we need to start having that conversation very early on if you want to change the, you know, the culture of not just uh, here in the U.S. we have a huge problem. I'm not sure how it's in the Czech Republic or in other places, but 
uh, it's a very valid statement to make. And I'm really glad someone said it. Um, I should have said it too. But uh, I think, you know, we, we focus a lot on the when they're in and when they get out, but never really on what happens at home. Uh, and so we should do that more. Thank you, Ernan. Well, that we actually have another hand from the Czech Republic. We have Peter Hampacher with us. He's a counselor social worker at Mayak Plus. And um, Peter. Okay, so do you hear me? Yeah. Okay, it's nice to meet you, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity. I just want to uh, add something from the point of uh, practice in the Czech Republic. I work as a social worker with the youth and young adults uh, for 15 years have been working with this uh, target group and I've been touching the uh, topics of criminal justice. And uh, I just want to somehow pin out the uh, first thought that Petra uh, introduced in her presentation, that it's not only about uh, restorative justice practice or programs, but uh, mostly what we try to achieve and to implement is uh, thinking about restorative justice principles. And I just want to share my, uh, my experience, my professional experience that uh, working with the youngsters uh, who are in the conflict with a, with a crime or some criminal punishment in the Czech Republic, if they got the opportunity to get in touch with a restorative approach, let's say, uh, that's uh, some kind of the uh, pre-match that uh, I think Shoshana was it? Uh, was asking the question, um, uh, was, uh, was talking about, uh, it gives them a really good experience and a really good personal, uh, yeah, personal experience in their further life, uh, even though if they, if they do not, if they behave or uh, go with the, with the flow uh, and get into trouble in the future, they can, they can somehow call upon uh, this experience on, uh, on the field of educational field, schooling, social services, and uh, the cases that I'm aware of uh, are much more easier, um, let's say, uh, intervene with the, with the restorative approaches. And the outcome uh, from this experience is that uh, we work with the young adults as well. So we, we follow some of our clients till the age of 26 or somehow like that. That we know that uh, in, in numbers that they can uh, somehow uh, take much wider and much more responsible approach in dealing uh, with their crime that they have committed. And right there. Um, can I just interject? Do you, yeah. Is there a question that you would have for for uh, for the panelists, or you uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm just closing up. It, it was okay. just uh, another reaction for for what Petra uh, Petra and Herman said. So I just want to share some uh, experience from the social field. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and of course, as far as uh, the, the work, I'll introduce this in a minute, but we have another, um, um, another webinar coming up in two weeks that will be looking at the public health approach and the total, uh, the whole system approach to justice. Um, and uh, I hope people can join us for that as well. Uh, ben Glan, I believe, has a question. He's a colleague. He's the, the chief operating officer at Salzburg Global Seminar. Uh, and Ben has been involved with this initiative since before it started. So we've been working together with our partners for several years, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and Ben has been involved in those discussions right from the beginning and, and uh, has been very active in this. And so uh, Ben, I, I hand that over to you. You are muted. Sorry, it told me that the host was not allowing me to unmute, but then the host very kindly allowed me to unmute. So um, anyway, hi everybody. Thanks very much, Charles. And uh, thanks Petra, Hanan, and Jana for a really fascinating presentation and such a, an open and um, an important one. The question I wanted to ask is just sort of to the three of you reflecting on 
your experience in the program so far and on this conversation, where you think there's the greatest opportunity for international examples to play a role in local contexts. You know, Hernan, you talked a lot about the cultural shift that's needed to go from a punitive uh, oriented uh, justice system to one that uh, is more restorative or more recognizing that uh, perpetrators are often victims themselves. And there are lots of examples that have come up in the context of this program. Charles just mentioned one from Glasgow. There's examples from South London. There's examples from, from Georgia and other places where communities or countries have attempted to make the shift from punitive systems to restorative ones. And I'm curious from each of your standpoints, if there are things that have stood out from these global examples that are useful to you, number one, and number two, as we think forward in this program, where you think the greatest um, and most important points of intersection could be uh, for, uh, for our work in this area moving forward. Um, I can lead off. I, I think, you know, it's been, it's been a wonderful experience to meet uh, the perspectives of different people from all around the globe. Um, I realize now that, you know, when it comes to criminal justice too here in the US, we're an oddball compared to everyone uh, and, and what some innovative things are happening in other parts of the world. Um, I also recognize that again, that there is, if it's not, you know, a criminal justice system, it might be war, it might be other things that are actively impacting communities in, in, in other contexts. And so I want to acknowledge that when we're talking about healing and justice, um, as a collective conversation, you know, this is a, a topic that I think uh, we've narrowed, narrowed into this topic of criminal justice, but it is a conversation that we should be having globally around uh, supporting the mental health of our communities uh, everywhere, and that this is a, a public health matter uh, that needs to be addressed collectively, uh, and taking some of the kernels of, of what has worked in other places, and trying to create things that work for different places too here in the US and abroad, um, around that, you know, and I think that we have a bad uh, tradition of, of looking for the best practice uh, for the blueprint, for the gold standard. Um, we use those terms a lot here in the U.S. Um, I'm very cautious of using a best practice because it's best practice to who, who did the research, who analyzed it, uh, and who deemed that particular, you know, body of work as a best practice. And so I think you know, there, there's intentional conversations right now that we've had here in Salzburg um, uh, as a collective, right, as all the fellows have joined in conversation. And I think that there is a space now to continue having uh, conversations around maybe working with some particular fellows on the projects that they are doing, their initiatives, their, their organizations, and partnering to build a, a much stronger foundation for that work uh, and being able to learn from other models and systems from around the globe uh, to pull from that. Uh, I will say, that I think uh, all other countries are much more open to that. I, I feel like here in the US, everybody has a tradition for thinking we know best what the world needs, uh, which we don't. And I will openly say that I'm open to all of you for you know expertise and guidance and learning from these different models. But I think that that's what we need to do. And that's a great next step forward, which is just engaging in conversation. And, and maybe if any of you here, or those of you who watch this after the fact are interested in partnering to, to think through uh, how we can build uh, partnerative solutions, um, partnering solutions uh, together to be able to keep building on this momentum and energy. I think that that's where the biggest opportunity lies in, in more collective partnership uh, around the globe, around this topic uh, and inviting other uh, international dialogue as well. Because um, again, here in the US, we, we are very US centric. Uh, we don't look outwardly uh, until you know, we, we've run out of options is what I always say. And, and, and I think that that's a culture that I'm not exclusively connected to. And so I welcome the opportunity for, you know, partnering with others outside. Thank you, Anand. That's, uh, that's music to our ears because that's, that's what we have been trying to do with this initiative. And the initiative, of course, is not over. It's just, we had the first year where we were trying to surface these ideas and be uh, able to build on that. And, and we look forward to working with people uh, both people who are here live and, and all the people watching and people you know in your networks uh, in the coming coming phases. Um, Petra, uh, Jana, do you have a response? You know, ben asked you about what is your, um, 
which examples would you would you would you uh, would you highlight, Jonah? Um, hi. Uh, yeah, I think the um, I did get there was one um, moment where some of us presented, and then we were in breakout rooms, and we were able to present those who watched the presentations a question um, to do some collaborative problem solving, and I did get I got a lot from that. Um, so I think more. Uh, intentional conversations. Um, that's kind of how my uh, brain is. It's like, okay, what um, we can talk and learn. And that's always really good. And I've gotten a lot from just hearing people um, present their work um, from all around, but then presenting, you know, I have this issue. There are, um, there's a group from a wide array of professions and experiences and skills and having insights from those varied experiences is very useful. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say right now. Petra, final comments? Yeah, <clears throat> uh, I would say that uh, it's, um, uh, for us here, it's very important that we can uh, work together with our partners like throughout the Europe and also from other countries and take the examples. But uh, what I was, uh, uh, you know, with restorative justice, always very excited uh, about was the, the sentence from uh, its founder, Howard there was saying that uh, restorative justice, it's uh, not a map, it's a compass. So it's, uh, it's just giving some direction. And the, that's uh, what, uh, and there is of course not any restorative worldwide authority that will say like, you have to do it like that. The, the, the principles uh, are there also uh, for looking for your own uh, solution. So every country has a different uh, history, culture, uh, and looks differently in every uh, country. There are, of course, some similarities, but uh, what I'm what I find important is that what we are doing now is that, uh, that we open the dialogue for what is the Czech way of restorative justice, like uh, what's important for us, how we reflect uh, on the history, what we need to change, and uh, using the principles as the guideline. Uh, so, uh, of course, the co like international and European cooperation in that way is very valuable for us. So we because so we can show that it's working somewhere. So uh, with our Finnish partner, we can we can talk about the program uh, uh, in prisons where. Uh, parents of children who were murdered are talking with uh, their offenders and uh, showing like how the dialogue can transform their lives. Uh, we can show the Belgian examples like how they have uh, uh, the restorative programs accessible for all types of crimes in every stage of the criminal proceedings. So those are of course very important uh, uh, cooperations, but I also like that uh, you look for what you need in the context of your country. Thank you, Petra. And I think that's a, a, a good place to end. Um, you know, where the justice system has not provided safety and security for everyone, what sort of reform is necessary to achieve that? Uh, and so these sharing of experiences across borders opens uh, examples of systemic changes that can be adapted for other contexts. And, and I, I do take note of Vernon's comment earlier, it can't just be a cookie cutter approach where we just take one example and say, oh, well, let's do that somewhere else, but it's the learnings from that. So the working groups that we've had in 2021 provided such rich discussions uh, taking place off the record. So unlike this one, which is, uh, which is gonna be posted live uh, and which will be posted on our website afterwards. Um, We've had these small but diverse groups which have had open exchange. We're highlighting the concrete ideas. All of this is in the report, which, um, which Antonia I think can share again in the chat uh, so that everybody has a link if you haven't seen it. That is full of great resources uh, which have been identified by, by our fellows so far. And we welcome policy leaders and innovators to get in touch with us and join us as we expand this initiative's reach and impact this year and into the future. We would in particular seek those public officials who are in instrumental positions, able to implement reforms and who are seeking ideas that can be adapted in their own jurisdiction. 
And Tonya will now put up a, a, a slide, which will show us our next meeting of our next webinar, which will be on February 10th. It will be 11 o'clock uh, in the morning in um, uh, Eastern Daylight Time in the United States uh, and five o'clock in the afternoon in Central European time. Uh, we hope you can join us for that. The topic will be the public health approach to justice. Uh, as has been briefly mentioned here, a public health approach treats violence like a health crisis, suggesting that policymakers use scientific evidence to identify what causes violence and what interventions can stop it from spreading. This expands into a whole system approach when different organizations and professions come together to support youth and address the causes of violence holistically. The next webinar in this series will consider how these strategies have been implemented by people of widely different backgrounds and experiences in the United Kingdom, where they've done quite a lot of it. So we look forward to, uh, to seeing you um, either on the program or watching it later. I'd like to give a big thank you to our, our partners in all of this, the MacArthur Foundation, the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation, and the David Rockefeller Fund, without whom this would not be possible. Our speakers today, Petra, Hernan, and Gianna, for, for sharing their experiences and, and personal stories as well uh, has been very, very important. Uh, and the rest of the team at Salzburg Global Seminar, so Ben Glan, uh, behind the scenes, you, you may have heard from Antonio Bemeke, uh, and Laura Julie Parech, who's our Chief Program Officer and Vice President, and, and Elia Nazari, who's also, uh, who's also been helping us with the logistics today. So thank you very much for your, for your support in the, in the webinar. I remind you the recording will be available and posted in the next few days, and some of you are just watching that. We are going to capture some of the rich resources which have been added to the chat uh, and post that along with the, um, with, the, with the recording. So those of you who are watching this in a recording can also benefit from some of the, the, the comments and the, uh, the resources that have been put up in the chat uh, as well. There are ways to engage with us in the future. You can follow us on Facebook, subscribe to our newsletter, uh, which uh, Antonia will put into the um, into the chat as well right now. That's uh, salzburgglobal.org slash go slash subscribe. And that will notify you on when the next webinar will take place. And you can sign up for that as well. If you'd like to get engaged in this initiative as it moves into the next phase, please let us know. And if you know of officials or social entrepreneurs or anybody who might wish to benefit from small specialist off the record interactions, with people from around the globe that might help them consider reform opportunities that would be replicable or adaptable um, or informative in their own jurisdictions or who themselves have innovative examples they would like to share with us, please also connect them with us. So thank you all for being with us today. Uh, thank you all of you who are watching us online after the fact, um, please be in touch and we look forward to hearing from you. So thank you all and, uh, and have a nice day and Good luck with all of your work. Bye everyone, thank you.